Electric charges can affect other electric charges that are far away from them. In electromagnetism, this connection between cause and effect is expressed using the electric field concept. The cartoon shows the electric field lines of four point charges of different magnitude. Since the point charges are arranged in an odd fashion and because they carry different amounts of charge, the pattern of field lines is quite complex. The lines start and end at a charge or they go all the way to infinity, since electric interactions have an infinite range. The electric field concept is illustrated on this slide with respect to an origin that is on the left hand side. Although the situation is symmetric, one may distinguish between a cause and an effect. The cause is a charge or a charge distribution rho that creates an electric vector field E of R. The position in space of the source charges of the electric field is identified by the position vector R prime, indicated here by a red arrow. This position vector needs to be distinguished from the position vector R that identifies a point of interest outside the charge distribution, indicated here by a blue arrow. A small positively charged test charge placed outside the charge distribution that is the source of the electric field will feel the electric interactions. Placing this test charge at different positions outside the source charge will cause it to follow different trajectories. These trajectories we call field lines. The test charge thus maps out the electric field caused by the source charges. Using the SI system, one may imagine the test charge to have a magnitude of 1 Coulomb. The direction of these field lines at every point of interest, R, is indicated by the electric field vector E of R, shown here inside the green rectangle. The direction of this field vector at this position is equal to the direction of motion of the positive test charge and the magnitude of the field vector equals the strength of force on this test charge at this point. Having introduced the field vector E of R, the field lines can therefore also be seen as representing the direction of this field vector at a particular point in space and indicating the path the test charge would take its space under the influence of this field vector. The electric field caused by the source charges permeates all space. This means that at some distance, as indicated by the green triangle here, other charges experience the presence of this electric field through a force. If there is some charge Q2 identified by the position vector R2 as indicated, that is at some distance from the source charges, this charge Q2 will experience the electric field too. In particular, the electric field will exert a force on Q2 that is given by Q2 times the electric field at the position R2. The conceptual electric field lines can be visualized by suspending semolina grains in oil. This is shown here. Two electrodes, a line electrode and a ring electrode, are facing each other. They are charged with different polarity. For example, negative polarity on the left and positive polarity on the right. The electric field created by the static charges in ring and line polarizes the semolina grains so that they start aligning with the field lines. Polarization means that one end of the elongated grain becomes positively charged and the other end becomes negatively charged. Inhibited somewhat by the inertia of the insulating oil that prevents a direct current flow from the positive to the negative electrode, the pattern of the semolina grains shows the electric field lines. Interestingly, the interior of the ring remains field free. This is known as the Faraday cage effect. Shown here are semolina grain patterns for different electric fields. From top left to bottom right, first 
the field of a point charge with field lines emanating radially away from the point charge. Then next to it the field of two charges that have opposite polarity plus and minus, a dipole field. Then next to it the field associated with two light charges facing each other. Starting the bottom row, the field of a tip facing a plate. Next to it the electric field of two parallel plates. And finally the field free interior of a ring electrode with on the exterior field lines going to infinity. Shown here are the field line patterns of a dipole and a quadrupole. The dipole is created when two point charges face each other. A quadrupole is the consequence of four point charges, two of them being positively charged and two of them being negatively charged. The two patterns illustrate that field lines, as shown here, illustrate the field strength through their density. In contrast, electric field vectors point in the same direction as the field lines, however they indicate the strength of the field through their length. By definition, electric field lines identify the path of a positively charged test charge. Therefore, they always originate at a positive charge and they always end at a negative charge. Experimental evidence of the long-range electrostatic force was first collected by Charles Augustin de Coulomb in 1785. He devised an instrument that we know as the Coulomb torsion balance. A historical print is shown at the top left. In a torsion balance, a spherical conductor is attached to a torsion wire. This conductor can be charged. If a second charge conductor is brought close to it, the wire experiences a deflection. This deflection can be made visible using a light source and a mirror. The light beam is reflected by the mirror onto a scale which makes the twist of the torsion wire visible. Coulomb showed in this way that the deflection, which is a measure of the force acting on the charged sphere, is a function of distance according to 1 on r squared, whereby r is the distance between the two charges. This is a modern realization of Coulomb's torsion balance. The torsion wire with a mirror with a laser spot visible are on the right. The two conducting spheres are charged and since they are in contact they carry the same amount of charges of the same polarity. Withdrawing the left sphere means that the force, the Coulomb force, on the right sphere depends on the distance of separation. This can be seen. Mathematically, Coulomb's law can be expressed by identifying the positions of the two point charges as shown here, with vectors r1 and r2. The distance of separation between the charges q1 and q2 can also be expressed by a vector, which is called r12. It is the difference vector of r1 minus r2. The unit vector r12 hat that points in the same direction as R12 is therefore the difference of R1 minus R2 divided by the magnitude of that vector. The Coulomb force F12 is therefore given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the product of the two charges Q1 times Q2 divided by the magnitude of the difference vector R1 minus R2 cubed times that difference vector. Separating the unit vector pointing in the direction of the force gives in the next line 1 on 4 pi epsilon naught times q1 q2 divided by the magnitude of the difference vector r1 minus r2 squared times the r12 hat unit vector. This is a similar demonstration of Coulomb's law, however the torsion wire has been replaced with a modern force sensor.
accepting Coulomb's law as experimentally proven, one can derive the electric field of a point charge. That's illustrated here. It requires a simple redefinition of the two charges by considering one, in this case Q2, as the source charge and Q1 as a test charge, which probes the electric field created by the source charge Q2. Placing Q2 at the origin, the vector R11 is the separation vector and has the associated unit vector R11 hat. The Coulomb force F Coulomb can then be written as Q1 times the electric field at its location. This electric field is equal to 1 on 4 pi epsilon times the source charge Q2 divided by R12 squared times the unit vector in units of volt per meter. As a small exercise, one can show that the units of the electric field strength, namely volt per meter, are consistent with the dimension of Coulomb's law, which is measured as a force in Newton. It is important to understand how the simple situation just involving two charges relates to the much more complex situation where many charges interact with each other or even charge distributions. All electrostatic interactions between charges are mutual and they superimpose according to the principle of linear superposition. This means that the net force and the net field vectors are the vector sum of all contributing individual force or field vectors. Vector addition, in line with the principle of linear superposition, has to be applied in order to solve this simple problem that concerns three charges, two of them with a charge magnitude of plus 5q and one, the top one, with just a magnitude of q. All of them are positively charged and repel each other. This immediately excludes option D, since the three force vectors point in the wrong direction. Which depiction is correct? A quick sketch helps solving the problem. The forces due to the two bottom charges on the top charge are of the order of about 5 in arbitrary units and they're pointing at uh, 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock respectively. This gives a moderately long force vector pointing upward. In contrast, the force exerted by the left bottom charge on the right bottom charge has a magnitude that's more like 25 in arbitrary units and it's pointing in the horizontal direction to the right. This has to be added to a contribution from the force exerted by the top charge onto the bottom right charge, which is only of the order of magnitude of 5 in arbitrary units and points to about 5 o'clock. This gives a very long force vector that's pointing at about 4 o'clock to the right. And similarly, such a vector occurs on the left-hand side pointing to about 7 o'clock for the left bottom charge. Looking at this picture then shows that this situation is in best agreement with the solution E given on the previous slide. In the Maxwell equations, the principle of linear superposition and the applicability of vector algebra are implicitly assumed. The net electric field E at a point of interest at R is therefore the linear vector superposition of the individual fields EI at R of all contributing source charges n. The simplest case is n equals 2 and indices i and 2. This situation is shown as an example at the bottom of the slide. Two positive charges qi and q2 are located at positions r1 and r2. The point of interest is identified by the position vector r. The two electric field contributions are given individually and the net field at R is the vector sum of both. Applying the same principle to a larger number of charges N leads to the expression given at the top of this slide. With the net electric field given as 1 on 4 pi epsilon times the sum of all these charges QI times R minus RI whereby RI is the position of each charge divided by the magnitude of that difference vector cubed. The diagram illustrates how this approach can be generalized to a continuous charge density. 
the sum of discrete charges is then replaced by an integral over volume. In the integrand we now find the continuous charge density rho v and the same fraction r minus r prime divided by its magnitude cubed. The standard problem of electrostatics is to determine the force on a charge q that is at a position r for a given distribution of source charges. This standard problem can be readily solved through direct integration over the charge distribution times r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime cubed using the expression on this slide. Once the electric field at r has such been determined, the force on the charge q is readily given by q times e. This volume integral over a vector can in principle always be determined and thus the standard problem can be solved like this. However, even for simple charge distributions, this integration can be quite complex and complicated. Fortunately, other techniques exist that offer simpler alternatives for many important situations.